This video will cover questions 22 to 27 from chapter 5. Let's go ahead and get started. Solve each system of equation below. We have two problems we're going to be looking at. The first one is y equals 3x plus 1 is equal, uh, sorry, y equals 3x plus 1, and then x plus 2y equals negative 5. So it's set up for substitution, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to substitute the 3x plus 1 in for y into the second equation. And then we have one equation with one variable, so we can solve it. So I distributed the two, combine my like terms, subtract the two to the other side, divide by seven, and we get x equals negative one. And then we can take that value, plug it back in the first equation, three times negative one plus one. Negative three plus one is negative two. So our solution is negative one comma negative two. That's where the two lines will intersect. All right, let's go ahead and look at question B. Uh, this one is more set up for elimination where you have the variables on one side. And so nothing eliminates right away by adding the two equations. So we're gonna have to multiply one or both equations by something. If we eliminate the x, we can multiply, that's a one right there, we can multiply that equation by negative two. Now I'm gonna keep the top equation the same, so I'm gonna rewrite it, and then the bottom equation, everything gets multiplied by a negative two. And what that will do, it will change the coefficients and the constant um, by a factor of two, but it allows us now to add the x's and now they eliminate. So seven y is equal to seven, divide by seven y is equal to one, Plug that back into one of your two equations. I plugged it into the second one, x minus 2, add 2 to both sides, and we get x equals 3. So 3 comma 1. And that's, once again, practice on solving systems of equations. In the first case, we use substitution. In the second case, we used elimination. On question 23, solve each equation for the indicated variable. So on A, we're going to solve for the B value. So we have T equals A times N plus B. So what we're trying to do is solve for B. That means this whole term we need to subtract to get 0 because A N, A times N minus A times N will cancel and give you 0. And then we have T minus A times N is equal to B. So there's our solution. B is equal to T minus A N. All right, let's go on to B. We got Y divided by 3 minus A is equal to B. This one we're going to solve for Y. So on this one, before we can do anything with that term, we have to do something with the minus A. So we're going to once again add A to both sides. That gives me 0. And so you're left with y divided by 3 is equal to b plus a, or a plus b, the one's fine. And then now, y divided by 3, so we're going to undo that by multiplying by 3. And we'll do the same thing to the other side. Now since we're adding b and a, we're going to need that in parentheses when we go to multiply by 3. So y is equal to, I'm going to put the 3 in front of the parentheses, 3 times b plus a. If you want to distribute, you can, but at this point you can leave it. Uh, just the way it is, we have solved for y. All right, on to c, we have m is equal to y divided by x. We're solving for the y value, so we need to, one way or another, deal with the fraction. y is being divided by x, so we will multiply by x to both sides. So x times m, or mx or xm, doesn't matter is equal to y, and that was just a one-step problem there. y is equal to xm or mx. And then the last one, d, we have m is equal to y over x again, but this time we're going to solve for the x value. We still have to deal with the um, denominator. We don't want a fraction here, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply by x. It doesn't solve for x, but it does get rid of the fraction, so x times m is equal to y. And then now we can divide by m on both sides to get x is equal to y divided by m. So the same step for the, for the one above um, on, on c, or actually below here, um, to get the x out of the denominator, but then we had to do one more step. 
Question 24 is dealing with simplifying expressions, dealing with looks like exponents here. So we'll start with a. We have 6 times x times x. I'm going to go ahead and expand this first one out just as a kind of reminder. And then on the bottom, you have 3 times x times y. So we can create 1s. When we have y divided by y, there's a 1. x divided by x, there's a 1. And then 6 divided by 3 will give you 2. So that will give us 2 times x times y squared or 2xy squared. So you can continue to expand those out um, so you can see what they are uh, when you get to cancel them. B, we have negative, I'm going to put a 1 right there just so you can see it, but it's negative mn or negative 1 times mn raised to the third power. Once again, I'm going to expand this out just in case this kind of helps you see everything that is happening here. So negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is still negative 1. m times itself 3 times is m cubed and n times itself 3 times is n cubed. So uh, we have negative 1 or if you just want to get rid of the 1 which is perfectly fine also. You have negative m cubed times n cubed. c m times n raised to the negative 3. Now this one's a little bit more difficult to expand out because it is a negative exponent. Um, so we want to deal with that. When something is raised to a negative, we're going to move it in terms of the reciprocal. So it's still going to be raised to the third power, but we want the positive third power, so it'll be in the denominator now. Now you could expand it out if you wanted to. But when you expand it out, you're going to get m times m times m, so that's m cubed, and then n times n times n, which is n. Cubed. So 1 divided by m cubed times n cubed. And the last one, d, is scientific notation. 3 times 2, I'm sorry, 3.2 times 10 to the negative second divided by 8 times 10 to the positive 3. So when we're dealing with exponents with division, we are going to subtract, but we do need to take the 3.2 and divide that by 8. And when we take 3.2 and divide it by 8, we will get 0 0.4 times, and then now this is going to be negative 2 minus 3. So 0 0.4 times 10 to the negative fifth. Now, scientific notation, we don't care about the negative exponents. Those are fine. But what we need to do is make sure this number here that is being multiplied by those powers of 10 is between 1 and 10. So we are going to have to move the decimal point, and we're going to have to move it one place to the right, so now it'll be 4.0, or just 4, times 10 to the what? Well, we had a small number, we were moving it to the right, so we are going to have to subtract 1 from the, exp excuse me, from the exponent, and we get 4 times 10 to the negative 6 power. Question 25. Determine the domain and range of each of the following graphs. Remember, domain represents your x values, and the range represents your y values. So on part A, these have arrows on the graphs, means they continue to go on. Um, so not only do they continue to go down, they continue to go left and right, they continue to open up. So your x values will be all real numbers, your domain. So domain, we're going to say, is all real numbers. And then for the range, it doesn't go up and down forever. This is the maximum value it will get to. Now it will continue to go down forever, but the maximum value is here at 1. So your range is all y values that are less than or equal to 1. Alright, and that wasn't supposed to be b. There we go. Alright, now we'll look at b next. And so B is very similar to A, just as a parabola opening up. So same idea, your domain, it's still going to continue on. So it's going to continue to open left and right, so that's all real numbers again. And then the range, now it doesn't have a max. It has a minimum at negative 1, but it continues to go up forever though. So your Y values now are all values that are greater than or equal to negative 1. On graph C, another parabola, 
the graph continues to go on as the errors indicate. So once again, the domain is all real numbers. And then the range, this one has a max. And make sure you pay attention. This value right here, that's the that's the x value. We're looking for the y value. So the y value is at 0. So we want all values of y that are less than or equal to 0. On D, we have a um, similar type of graph in terms of it having a max or min. And it's a v-shaped instead of a u-shaped. So this is an absolute value graph. But once again, the graph continues to go up in this case, but it also goes left and right. So your domain is going to continue to be all real numbers for this one. And then the range, there's the smallest value right there. So that's the min at negative 1, but it is going to continue to go up. So for your range, we want all values of y that are greater than or equal to negative 1. So there's uh, four graphs in terms of domain and range. On 26, the graph below compares the age and the number of pets for a certain population. Describe the association for this population. So once again, pay attention to your units here. You have the graph below, compares the age. So this is the age down here on your x-axis. And the number of pets for a certain population on your y-axis. So do you see any association between the years and the number of pets for a certain population? Okay, and so to me it doesn't really look like there's any association between the two, so there's no association between the number of pets and age. Question 27. At an aunt's wedding, Nicholas collected data about an ice sculpture that was about to completely melt. A graph of this data, a graph of his data, is shown at the right. Calculate the equation of the line of best fit, and then based on your equation, how tall will the ice sculpture one hour before Nicholas started measuring? So you see we've got a scatter plot. We want to draw in our line that best, best fits this data. Um, and just remember that our lines can definitely be different. Our equations will be slightly different as well. So I moved my line of fit to kind of fit the, at the data points as best I could. They're, they're pretty accurate, so uh, let's see what points I can use. It looks like it does cross the y-intercept at 0, 10, so I'm going to pick that one. That'll be a nice one. And then I was looking for another one. It doesn't cross the x-axis nicely at 4. It's a little bit above. Um, I'm looking at maybe this point right here. So that looks like that might be close to 4 and maybe... Two and a half. So I'm going to use that one. Four and two point five. Actually, the other way around. Sorry. Two point five, and the y value is four. So those are the two points I'm going to use uh, to calculate the equation of the line. So to find my rate of change, we're going to do the change of y over the change of x. So I have ten minus four, and zero minus. 2.5. So this will be 6 divided by uh, negative 2.5. And 6 divided by 2.5 is going to be equal to negative 2.4 is what I came up with. So uh, that's my rate of change. My y-intercept, I actually because my line looked like it crossed at 0, 10, I have my y-intercept already. I don't need to recalculate it at uh, 0, 10. And so therefore my equation would be y equals my rate of change, which was negative 2.4x plus 10. Now, once again, remember, if you pick two different points on your line, your equation is going to be slightly different. But it should be, um, it should be very close to what I have here. On part B, it says, based on your equation, how tall was the ice sculpture one hour before Nicholas started measuring? And so one hour before, well, here's zero hours when he started measuring. So one hour before that would actually rep represent an x value of negative 1. So we will take x equals negative 1 
plug that into our equation. Looks like we'll get 2.4 plus 10. So that's 12.4. So how tall was the ice sculpture one hour before Nicholas started measuring? It looks like it's approximately 12.4. Make sure you're paying attention to your units. Inches tall. And so make sure you answer the question. The ice sculpture was approximately 12.4 inches tall one hour before he started measuring.